you will not give rise to certain, for, pardon my language, certain stupid questions. So for instance, when the, the Ayyappa Swami case was going on, the Sabriwala case was going on, I had this brilliant question being asked on a regular basis. Anjaniya Swami is also Brahmachari, Ayyappa is also a Brahmachari. Women are allowed inside his temple, why are they not allowed in this temple? So imagine, and these questions were not coming from non-Hindus. These questions were not coming from the Christians and the Muslims. These questions were coming from Hindus, from educated families, supposedly educated families. Let me add that caveat. And who call themselves Hindu families. So their education is certainly in question and their Hindu claim is also an insignificant question according to me. And these were the ones to ask this question. Now, therefore it clearly tells me that it is mighty convenient of us to sit and blame the judiciary or the government or everybody else. But these people come from the society. And this is the reflection of the current state of the Hindu society. That these people who occupy these positions of power and responsibility obviously are choices that you have thrown up as a society. And therefore, there is no point in pointing fingers at one particular institution and calling it an anti-Hindu institution when the society itself has become unconsciously or subconsciously anti-Hindu without knowing that. And they believe that they are Hindu simply because they visited a temple. So this critical aspect is important because unless and un until you understand this critical concept of Sampradaya, you will always arrive at the conclusion that Hindu institutions are traditional in nature, they are conservative in nature and that they don't open their doors to everyone and that is why there is a fundamental weakness in Hinduism. And therefore, you will welcome everything at the expense of the living traditions that people like the Puja Acharyas follow. The one thing that as Hindus we have not been able to understand is that the Anushthanas that they follow, we are not in a position to follow nor are we capable of following it. What we follow for all practical purposes is what I would call Samanya Dharma, which is Hindu Dharma as practiced by the common Hindu, which is not the whole and soul of it. It is nowhere as close to, let's say, the purer form or the purest form that it is supposed to be. And therefore, you must strike a distinction between what they are entitled to do and what you are entitled to do because your discipline and your commitment to dharma is not the same. So when someone says, why can't I enter the Garbhagriha? You should ask him, what is your authority? And this authority is not a caste-based question. It is on spiritual practice-based question. Which is to say, are you following the Anushthanas that they are expected to follow? If not, please don't get in. It doesn't make a difference whether you are a woman or a man, it just doesn't make a difference. Now these are aspects which I think are fundamentally muddled in the Hindu mind itself. And therefore it is critical to preserve these islands of dharmic purity so that they can continue to spread the message of dharma and remove these layers of ignorance from our heads so that we understand the implications of a judicial verdict. Because the people who celebrated the Sabrimala decision mostly were the Hindus, not others. So, the, so it's like this, it's a two-way street. The institution does something without understanding dharma, but the community also welcomes it without understanding dharma. It's obviously a clap and therefore you need both the hands. Thank you so much. My just one question is that we are talking about that the girls don't allow in periods. They don't allow to enter in a temple. Can you see your vein, sir? In this vein, there is that bad blood. Because if my mother doesn't have periods, then maybe my birth doesn't happen, sir. You, sir, let me complete. Abhi Sai Deepak sir, I am not against anything. I am a Brahmin girl. I respect Hinduism. 
आई रिस्पेक्ट एवरीबॉडी मेरा सिर्फ एक ही कहना है क्वेश्चन मैम प्लीज रिप्लाई नो सर वो बिकॉज साई सर सेट कि आप कैसे पॉइंट आउट कर सकते हैं आप उस टेंपल के बारे में कुछ नहीं जानते सर पहले द्रौपदी को वन साड़ी में रखा गया था बिकॉज पीरियड्स वर पैड्स वर नॉट देयर सर नाउ वी एज अ गर्ल आई नो हाउ टू यूज मैंस्टुलेशन कप I know how to use pad, and I I am as pure as you are, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Sorry, I think you will continue the question and answer after this thing. Sign Sign Deepak is hard hard uh, stop. Please. Can I just request the lady to pay attention because I'm responding to your question, right? Okay. One. I don't see why you had to flaunt your Brahminical credentials because as long as you're a Hindu, there ends the matter. Okay. No, no. Let me let me respond. You're saying because you're saying that you're aware of the traditions because you're a Brahmin. Trust me when I say this, but most non-Brahmins know traditions better than Brahmins today. Okay. Okay. Second, second, and I say this as a time Brahmin myself. Okay. Three. You started the entire premise, and your argument is based on the assumption that the temple has a fundamental problem with menstruation, that it treats it as impurity, something which is which defiles the temple. I am asking you again and again and again in a loop like a stuck gramophone. What is the basis of this assumption? Where are you drawing this assumption from? How are you informed? What is your source? What is your authority? What is the factual basis? Please don't cite news reports. Have you done any reading on your own to come out with this conclusion? If the answer is a no, then you are relying on what we call secondary propositions, which is word of mouth. Okay? Nobody has been able to ask or let's say answer the specific question. When you say that this temple does not allow women, and it has a problem with women, it is based on misogyny. It's based on patriarchy. I want to ask each of these people. What do you know about the temple before you have made that comment? What have you read before you have made that comment? Are you saying that you know better than centuries of people who have actually worshipped at the temple and who have practiced that particular faith? Unless and until you have a specific position, kindly don't make yourself the representative of the entire female community. You are not. Second, you can't speak on behalf of believers. You can't speak on behalf of the deity. You can't speak on behalf of the temple. To put it in the language of Game of Thrones, you know nothing, Jon Snow. Thank you. Do not take pride in the fact that you've given so much of freedom to your children that they have no idea what their traditions are. I don't think that's a badge of honor to wear at all under any circumstances. That's a badge of shame. Now, the one thing that you have to realize is that whenever you speak of state control of temples, your mind immediately says, "I need the state for security. I need the state for maintenance. I need the state for crowd management. I need the state to handle administrative issues." And therefore, I'm happy to tolerate the presence of the state in the temple, as long as they don't touch my religion, as long as they don't touch my religious affairs. According to me, there can't be a more self-defeating distinction. The institution's management and administration is in the hands of a different entity altogether, which is dying to call itself a secular entity, doesn't want to call itself a Hindu entity, and a fundamentally secular entity is holding the reins of the administration of your religious institutions, and you're operating under the naive belief. that they will control only secular aspects which won't have an impact on religious aspects how is that even possible if the money is in their hands the ability and the power to appoint people to different positions is in their hands your security is in their hands how do you hope to have the freedom only with respect to religious affairs how is that even possible not possible so to assume that as long as the state gives me the commitment that it will not interfere with religious aspects of an institution i am happy and therefore my religion is secure impossible because what you believe are the secular aspects are the ones that give you the power to invest in the society money if it is secular is the one that gives you the ability to invest in your community so how can that essential aspect be in the hands of the government Shri Hari will vouch for this particular fact. The Jagannath Mandir in Puri is effectively run by 36 mathas. It's called the Chhattis Nijog. Chhattis Nijog. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It has participation from all the four varnas. 
all the four varnas, especially during the Ratha Yatra, who we call Adivasis are the ones who have the first right to see the deity as well as pull the Ratha. It has a different tradition altogether. Now, each of the Mathas are in the control of state government bureaucrats. Each of them saying, I don't have money, I don't have money. When the daily ritual of Jagannath Puri as a temple is based on contribution of all the 36 Mathas and over the years, every Matha has I mean, so progressively stopped its contribution to the daily ritual. So what you see in Jagannath Puri, now Sri Hari made an important distinction between big temples and chick chick temples is what he called it, small temples, right? Okay. Now, I am trying to tell you even in these so-called big temples, this is what happens. Now if this is the fate of big temples, then imagine what must be happening with chick chick temples. <laughs> so in these big temples, citing lack of resources, which is the secular aspect which you have given to the government, he is saying, I can't give today's prasada, do whatever you want. I don't have the money to renovate. I don't have the money to maintain this library. I don't have the money to digitize this particular manuscript. I don't have the money to ensure that people do not come and do something that they are not supposed to in a temple in terms of security, employing CCTVs and whatnot. So, this belief goes against dharmic principles because dharma and artha go hand in hand in dharmic philosophy. In fact, if you read Mahapariva's book, Chandrasekhar Saraswati's book, Devatin Kuril and its English tra translation, he makes a very clear point that for fulfillment of dharma you need artha. And therefore, if artha is in the hands of the state, which is the Rajya, how on earth do you think you have the freedom to fulfill your dharma? Not possible. So let us break this wall completely which says religious and secular are two different things. No, that is the Christian mentality, that is Christian philosophy, that is not Hindu philosophy. Hindu philosophy effectively says dharma and artha go hand in hand. We realize that you need Lakshmi to run even an institution that is dedicated to Saraswati. We are very clear about that. We don't need to be embarrassed about the fact that you need money to run a religious institution. Hinduism does not celebrate poverty. It does not celebrate poverty. If you believed in poverty, would you be able to provide facilities to all the followers of this particular matha or any other matha for that matter when they come from different places? They come from all walks of life. All of them may not be equally placed as far as their status is concerned. Therefore, the one place that they come must act as a leveler so that everybody is treated as one here and therefore facilities must be provided. Where will that money come from? So when someone tells you, why should a religious institution have so much money? Please ignore that person as a secular Hindu idiot because he doesn't know what he is talking about. Anyone who tells you that a religious institution must not have money because the moment it has money it is corrupt, then thank you, let the state not collect taxes. Because the moment you contribute something by way of tax to the state, well, it is bound to become corrupt. And the state is fundamentally corrupt according to me. Whether it has money or not, it doesn't make a difference. So therefore, first break that wall in your head. Second, I'll keep giving you examples as I go along. When you have a matha or a temple, why do Hindus contribute land to that particular temple or matha? What is the logic? Two reasons, largely two reasons. One, that the temple or that land acts as a source of revenue for the temple. That's one. Second, land translates to real estate, translates to Hindu presence. So that the land which is adjoining a temple or a matha must be owned by people who are followers of the sampradaya of that matha so that they respect the tradition of that matha or temple. 
otherwise you will have slaughter houses open right outside the matha if it happens to be a shakta matha then that's a different issue it can have a slaughter house no problem but even then it must be cut not in the halal fashion but in the hindu fashion which is the jhatka fashion therefore even if if it happens to be a shakta tradition i would be happy to give a meat house to someone who happens to be a practitioner of the shakta tradition and to nobody else not just to any hindu i will give it only to someone who practices that particular sampradaya understand that so even within hinduism if the temple or the matha subscribes to a particular philosophy the administration and the assets of that particular matha or temple must be with the followers of that particular philosophy it's not enough if he if he happens to be a hindu please understand that so think of hinduism like a telescope the largest lens or the bigger lens is the hindu lens but it keeps opening into small lenses and each small lens is the sect and the subsect so if the institution belongs to the subsect then the institution must be run by people who are in that particular subsect why is this point important two days ago the supreme court has come out with a verdict saying when you issue or when you issue tenders for shops surrounding a certain temple apparently non hindus can apply for that particular tender because it is a secular activity what has it got to do with religion you see how this distinction works the moment you separate the secular from the religious in the context of a religious institution you are creating an anomaly because everything about a religious institution is religious 100% why because i am interested in using the resources of my community only for my community is good and nobody else is good i am entitled to make that particular statement i don't need to prove my secular credentials with respect to a religious institution if i can't be religious with respect to a religious institution where will i be religious i don't understand <laughs> look at the stupidity of this position this is the one place where i'm allowed to wear my religion on my sleeve where i'm entitled to say yes i am a hindu yes i am a shakta yes i am a shaivite nobody else who does not subscribe to this particular sampradaya has a business entering into this particular place whether you are a hindu or not doesn't make a difference as long as you do not subscribe to the traditions of this particular place you will not set foot inside this place that should be your position what is so wrong about this a baptist cannot enter the the church of a seventh day adventist they have these denominational rivalries going on all, so much that if one person from one particular denomination marries another person from another particular denomination they will be denied even access to burial grounds do we do that in our communities strengthen your sampradayik institutions by giving them the confidence that you will back them in their negotiations with every arm of the state that your dharmic institutions can negotiate with the powers so to speak with the confidence and the comfort and assurance that its followers stand by them when someone says all of these problems are because hindus don't have unity hindus don't have unity what are you talking about are you telling me that every other community has unity no they have unity only when it comes to an outsider but otherwise they keep arguing and fighting among themselves in this case if every matha is at least confident of the fact that its supporters can protect themselves and will also stand by the matha whenever it is in negotiation with the government or with anybody else imagine the comfort with which the matha can operate and when bigger mathas are in a position to basically say notwithstanding our philosophical differences we will support each other because if we don't support each other we will be picked one by one at least operate under that particular pragmatism according to me the template for hindu unity is right in front of you you don't need to destroy sampradayik diversity to create hindu unity you can preserve your sampradayik diversity and also create hindu unity provided you know what are you united against and for since the ashtamathas or at least some of them have the glorious tradition of having participated in the ram janmabhoomi movement i can make this particular statement nobody participated in that movement as a brahmin kshatriya vaishya or any other community they participated in that movement as a hindu for a hindu cause 
So what does it tell you? Create a specific goal. Because the human mind cannot operate when you give it a vague goal. It needs very specific goals. You need to break it down and say, this is what you're fighting for. It's like trying to fight an election without showing who is the candidate you're voting for. Why do you need to show a face? Because you need to know which is the face that is most associated with this particular party and its causes. Similarly, a cause is the face of the movement. So, rally the community around causes. Identify specific causes. Be it cow slaughter, or conversions, or everything. Start putting faith in your community. If you don't do that, I believe that the time for hand wringing and empty posturing has run out. Because every security threat, whether it is internal or external, has a direct bearing on the ability of Hindus to survive and live in this country with dignity. Almost everything which affects this country in a negative way affects you first, because you are the target. You are the intended target. So, as I keep saying in other places, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, please read it to imbibe the spirit of Kshatra. That is the only way forward. And that spirit of resistance and Kshatra must show in every endeavor, including in representation in legal causes before the highest court of the land, in every court of the land. Start cultivating a vast network of Hindu-minded lawyers, or at the very least competent lawyers who are willing to work and therefore start pooling your resources to invest in your causes. Do not take illegal encroachment of your religious institutions, land or real estate lightly. It is not meant to be taken lightly because that is the way Hindu exodus begins. Gradually, slowly, but surely and steadily. So the only way is for you to invest significantly in this department. Dharmo Rakshati Rakshita.